Well, today's project, working on a, um, it's a friend of mine's truck. It's actually a, uh, it was a friend of my dad's. They were best friends growing, growing up, and then a um, family friend, and this dude's known me since I was born. Well, anyway, we're friends now, and now that I'm a mechanic, I work on his stuff. Uh, one of the very few people that I actually work on their stuff. Um, I've gotten to the point now where I don't usually work on cars and trucks um, for customers or anything. And just because I enjoy equipment more. I make most of my living off of YouTube and sponsors and stuff like that. So I don't really have to work on cars and trucks or anything anymore. Um, but, you know, family, friends, and he does pay me. You know, he pays me in, in full price and everything. So I am kind of selective about my work. But today, we got a chevy pickup i think it's a 2011 and um he's having a, a light come on i think the attraction control or stability track or something's going on and off and it's seeing the rear brakes or something like that so i'm gonna hook my scanner to it real quick that launch x431 pro mini find out what the codes were he said the lights were on and now they're off so we're gonna go ahead and hook up to it and see what we got so got that uh, the the launch scan tool if you guys haven't seen this scan tool I'll put a card up here. There'll be a link to the video down here. I made a video specifically about the scan tool, and there'll be a link down in the description for you guys that want to buy it. Um, these things sold really, really well, just FYI. A lot of people bought them. I think I've, I have think there's like 160 units have sold in about a month. That clues you in. Like, people are looking for a scan tool so badly that will do everything and not do the crap like Snap-on and uh, Genesis and all that. So anyway... Uh, it's a 2010 GMC Sierra, not a well, 2011, which doesn't make that big of a difference. Let's do a health report. That health report's going to go... So the health report is going to go through all the control modules. It's going to read all the codes, and then I can find out exactly what what code. Now, something about these Chevys that, um, uh, if you guys aren't familiar with this, sometimes these Chevys come up with a Stabilitrack error, and it'll say Stabilitrack... And it makes you think that it's a traction control issue. And it could be a traction control issue, like a wheel speed sensor or something like that, or an ABS sensor, rather. But Stabilitrack on these encompasses a whole variety of different things. There's a bunch of different issues that can cause a Stabilitrack error or Stabilitrack code. But if you guys have uh, any experience with these, my biggest suggestion if you get a Stabilitrack code is pull the code using a scan tool like this, do your research online before you go diving into this thing to try to figure out the problem. I have fixed the stability track code with just cleaning the throttle body on these. It's just that sometimes it's just that simple. Uh, other times, I mean, there's all kinds of certain, you know, different things that can uh, cause these things to, to flag. But as you can see, you got low battery. Now, the guy that owns this has multiple vehicles. He has uh, a motorcycle, he has a car, a Cadillac, and he's got this truck and he has a service vehicle. So when I have a certain, when I had service trucks, when I worked in the oil field or for other companies, I didn't have my own certain, you know, I didn't own the truck. A lot of times I wouldn't drive my personal vehicle for months. It would just sit. And his truck and his car and his motorcycle kind of does the same thing. You know, a motorcycle is always a fair weather kind of uh, deal. And he alternates between his car and his truck, but mostly he just stays in his work van all the time. So that's pretty pretty normal. So a lot of times when your vehicles sit around, if you don't have a battery maintainer or you're not real diligent on coming out and starting them and driving them every week, batteries will go dead and you have to keep putting batteries in them and stuff. You can put the battery disconnects, stuff like that on it, but nobody keeps up with that. And no fault code, no fault code, no fault code. We have a fault go over HVAC. We're not gonna worry about that one. Uh, remote control door lock receiver. I'm not gonna worry about that one. The supplemental inflatable restraint system. I might check that just to see what's going on. And electronic brake controller module. Uh, read the fault code. DTC display. Low brake fluid. So that's what. That's about what I thought. On these, they have a brake fluid sensor on the master cylinder itself. When your brakes wear down, your fluid level starts dropping. When the brakes get low enough your brake fluid level will go down in the reservoir and it'll start flagging a code and it'll be sporadic brake code. So you might need front brakes, you might need rear brakes, just depends. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and check the fronts to see where the pads are and then we're gonna look at the backs. I don't know how many miles this thing has on it, so we're gonna go ahead and check the brake system, uh, front and rear, see what, see what we have. So let's go back. I wanna see what this code is. Lost communication passenger presence detection sensor module. So what that is, is on the seat, on the bottom over here, there's a little sensor. And what it does, it if 
you guys remember back in 1996 to 2000 something whatever all vehicles had to have a key to turn the passenger seat airbag system off on and off didn't have an automatic detection system and what that was for is if you had a uh, if you had a pickup and you were carrying a car seat you didn't want the passenger side airbag to explode so manufacturers started putting uh, a little sensor down in the bottom of this seat that after a certain amount of weight i think it's like 30 pounds or something like that or 50 pounds it takes 50 pounds of pressure to move that seat down once it activates that switch then the passenger side airbag is uh, activated so it might have a problem something in that uh, the seat uh, that seat switch itself I know the owner of this truck isn't going to care about that he doesn't have any kids he's not going to have any kids uh, he's an older guy so he's done with his uh, baby holland days um, for the most part now as a mechanic and as a technician I always bring it to the attention of the owner I don't care if it's my mom I don't care whoever I always tell him hey man while I was working on it I found this code and this code and this code um you want me to check it out? You want me to fix it? Or you want me to just leave it alone? And I'll leave it up to them. You guys got to do that. You got to cover your, your butt on this stuff. If you don't, especially in a shop environment, and more importantly, you don't document that you told the owner, it'll come back and bite you. Owner will take the vehicle down the road. They'll have an accident or something. And then all of a sudden, it's your fault. And even though you told them, that, you know, hey, you needed upper and lower radiator hoses and you didn't do it and they blew a hose... You know, on their uh, family vacation, it ruined their whole $7,000 family vacation or whatever, and it's all your fault. You got it on the work order, uh, it'll cover your butt. As a, uh, a personal story of mine, I worked at uh, Midas when I was 23, 24, something like that. This lady comes in. So this lady comes in with this 1980s Jaguar. Um, this little, uh, little Asian lady, and she didn't speak English very well, wanted us to see what the problem was. She just bought this car. So it comes in and it is just wrecked. I mean, the entire car is junk, man. She says she just bought it. We put it up on the uh, the lift, took the wheels off. Every caliper bracket on the freaking car was broke, and somebody had drilled holes into the caliper bracket and the um, uh, the the tube. You know, because it's supposed to be a one piece bracket. They drilled holes in both sides and put wire through it, so just to hold it together. And the whole car was like this. And we put it up on the lift and I looked at it and I was like, I'm not working on this car, man. This is a disaster waiting to happen. So I went and showed my manager, pulled the lady out there. I was like, look, this car is unsafe. You don't, you know, our suggestion is don't drive it. Contrary to popular belief, I've had this, you know, people tell me that if you're a mechanic shop, you can take somebody's vehicle if it's unsafe and blah, blah, blah. No, you can't hold somebody's vehicle unless they owe you money on it. You have to give it back to them. Um, you can call the DOT or, you know, the police department, whatever, and tell them, hey, this car is unsafe, and the police department can handle it after that. Uh, but most of the time, they're not going to do anything about it. So, this is such a bad deal that I, I told the owner, I was like, look, something's fishy about this. Something's not right. This lady doesn't barely speak English. She doesn't know what we're supposed to look at on a car. She just wants us to look at it, and she can't really convey it very well. It's like, something's, I mean, we, we need to take pictures of this thing. We need to document it. So, we did. We took pictures of everything. We documented it. So, we took pictures of everything. We documented it. I go put all the wheels and tires back on the car. We make her sign a deal saying, it was like, hey, you understand that this car is unsafe to drive. We are not responsible for this car, period. After you, you know, leave our premises, we suggest you have a towed. She doesn't follow our advice. She just gets in a car, happy-go-lucky, goes down the road. Uh, I think she had her kid with her, you know, like a five or six-year-old too. Lo and behold, two hours later, car comes back on a record. Their claim was that I left all of the lug nuts loose on the car, every single one of them. Never done that in my entire life. I have, you know, made mistakes where I left, you know, uh, I put a wheel back on and finger tightened the uh, uh, the nuts or something. But I always caught it, you know, before, because I test drive the cars and everything. Somehow, I neglected to put any lug nuts back on the car tight at all. This car made it like two miles, supposedly made it two miles down the road. She turned, all the wheels came off of it, hit the ground, and it was a big, big cluster. So... The owner gets involved with this because now they're going to try to sue us for this car. They want us to do like $6,000 worth of repairs to this car, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, nah, I ain't going to do it. Well, the owner's an idiot. Owner comes up. Owner comes up and is like, oh, you're going to have to pay for that. I was like, bullshit, I ain't going to have to pay for that. I ain't going to pay for nothing. I ain't working on that car. You're out of your mind. Lo and behold, I didn't, you know, I quit <laughs> Midas very, very shortly after that. I didn't end up having to pay for it, but I don't know what happened to it. So um, that's my story. Now I'm going to... I'm going to go ahead and jack this truck up. 
Uh, I'm going to go to the front, and uh, his concern was the, the rears on this. I don't remember if I did the front brakes on this or not, but whenever the brake fluid low is low like that, gen generally, it's going to be your, you know, your front brakes wearing out first and your back brakes. So I'm going to go ahead and look at the whole brake system. We're going to find out. We're going to, and to look at the brake system on these, you got to pull the wheels and the uh, tires off and the drums off. So I'm going to take those off. I'm going to uh, think of lead the front on and use a little mirror, look in there, see if we need pads, and then kind of check the whole brake system over to see if we got any leaks. Here's a little tip for you guys doing these brakes, and especially on the drums. A lot of times you have to get in there and go through the adjuster in the back to loosen the shoes up enough to get the drum to clear. I don't know if I'm going to have to do that or not. All I got to do is take a trusty hammer, and if you hit it, keep hitting it with a hammer like that, it'll loosen up. I got the other side to loosen up. I'm gonna keep smacking this one, loosen it up, get that brake drum off. So we got them off and problem. Well, cylinder's leaking. That's pretty common for um, uh, the mileage on these. Now, there's two different trains of thought. Um, well, let me show you the other side too. So that's your brake shoes. Yes, it's a 2010 with drum brakes on the back. I don't know what Chevy was thinking. Drum brakes are just awful. And this side's even worse. He has plenty of pad left on the shoes. I will not put brake shoes back on once they've been suggested or su subjected to any kind of fluid. Uh, brake fluid or if the wheel seal's bad in here, that axle seal, you know, leaking. If these get wet, I don't, you know, I don't care if it's an 18 wheel or what. I'm not, you know, heavy equipment or not. I don't care. I'm putting new shoes on. Now, some mechanics will take a torch and they'll bake these and you know, you know, bake the oil out of it. And then they're like, oh, well, you've been doing this for 80 years. No, don't do that crap. Um, brakes are cheap, cheap insurance, all this stuff. I mean, you can get these wheel cylinders are like, you know, 10 bucks a piece or something like that, eight bucks a piece. Some new shoes are like 20 bucks or something. Uh, you can get the spring kits too, you know, new spring. I mean, every, all the parts you need on the side to replace all of this is maybe like 30 bucks a side. You know, so you're, you're, it's just ridiculous that people uh, end up doing stuff like that. So before I take this apart, I need to make sure I can get some brake shoes on hand and get some wheel cylinders on hand and, uh, go pick up the parts. Uh, I still need to look at the front. I think the front's going to be fine. This is probably where, you know, all the problems are going to come from. Um, I am going to need to pick up some more brake clean cause I'm out of brake clean and, uh, we'll go to the old O'Reilly's and see if they got all the parts. So another issue, uh, that CV boot is no good. That right there is the grease out of that CV axle. You know, it's a four, it's a four wheel drive and Chevy uses, I think Ford did the same thing or sort of this uh, independent front suspension bull crap. Um, you know, it, it gets better ride quality, I guess, but you know, I'm not a big fan of it. Solid axle for the win. If you guys look at your own vehicles and you see all of this goodness this like caked on stuff that means you got a problem something somewhere it's leaking either grease or brake fluid um or in a if you got a solid front axle it could be a wheel seal going out also he's gonna need tires pretty soon those are at specs i'm gonna tell him that that tire is bad too but i'm sure he knows that but remember whenever you're working on you know no matter what you're working on unless it, even if it's a it's a friend's vehicle or your mom's or your brother's or uh, whatever unless it's your own vehicle my own vehicle i don't do this i uh, probably should <laughs> Um, go over the whole vehicle, look everything, look at leak, and then let the owner know. It's like, hey, all this stuff needs to be fixed. Uh, I know the guy that owns this. I know I don't even have to ask him about that shaft. Uh, I could either pick up another shaft or get a boot and put the boot on there. It doesn't look like it's been leaking all that or it's flinging that grease out that long, so it looks like it's a relatively new problem. So I think the actual shaft itself is going to be fine. But I'm going to go, go around. Look at the rest of the truck and see everything that I need to go to the parts store and make a list. So, another issue. Tail shaft seal's leaking. That's pretty easy to fix. Go ahead and... I'm checking out these U-joints. Now, U-joints are kind of... They're extremely hard. I mean, sometimes they're really, really easy to test and diagnose. Sometimes they're extremely hard. Generally, what you do is you put the vehicle in neutral. Uh, if it's on, you know, if your rear wheels aren't on pavement, uh, since we're in, in park, all you do is you grab the drive shaft, shake it back and forth, and you're looking for this yoke and this part of the drive shaft 
to move independently. Like when you when you move this, they should move exactly the same. Well, what I'll do is I'll put my thumb on here like that, and I'll put my finger on here as I rotate. You're trying to feel any kind of movement and clicking. Now the reason I say these are kind of hard because they can have a rough spot somewhere in the bearings, and then you won't know until you remove the drive shaft itself. You pull it out, and you're able to flex this around. So I'm thinking he's gonna be okay. I don't know until we get the drive shaft out. If we need U-joints, and we can go get U-joints and stuff, but that's about all I see on this truck. Everything else looks okay. Once I replace the seal on this, I need to fill this up full of fluid. You make you dang sure don't want to run these these auto shift transfer cases out of fluid because it'll you know you know grenade the whole whole deal. So I got all the parts that I needed to get, and we're gonna do the uh, uh, the brake shoes on this thing. I don't really have a lot of good tips for you guys on brake shoes as far as how I get them done. Now the one thing that uh, does make a difference, they make a little tool to pull these little clasps out, a um, little screwdriver. I thought I had one, I didn't. Had I known that, I would have bought one at uh, the auto parts store. In a pinch, you can use a pair of needle nose pliers to get these twist locks out, but they're a pain. Um, if you got that little, it's worth uh, worth its weight in gold when you're doing brake jobs like this. That little, uh, it's got a red, and usually has a red handle, and it's got two different ends for different, two different size uh, spring retainers. But um, what I do is I take a pair of dikes. I'll grab the um, spring, pull the spring off, just pull that spring off, pull this spring off, pull your retainers off, and then start working on them. So um, I'll get this one pulled off. I already did the other side. Something else about these rear brakes. Um, I mean, I've done tons and tons and tons of these. I still only do one side at a time. So I'll take one, you know, I'll take both tires off, brake shoes or brake drums off. I'll have the other one sitting there. I don't have the new side. I'll take this all apart, try to put it back together. But you want to leave one side together because if you get confused about something, you need a reference. Uh, do not, do not take both sides all the way apart because you'll be sitting there scratching your finger, scratching your butt, trying to remember, does this spring go here? Does it flip around this way? If you have a reference side, you're you're pretty good. You can figure it out. You know, most time most guys can figure it out. But I'm go ahead and get this torn apart. So the shoes are done. Put new um, something else about doing shoes. I don't know if I mentioned this in the first part of the video or not. Uh, whenever you do brake shoes, buy a hardware kit, spring kit. Go ahead and replace those um, uh, hardware and the springs. You know the, the springs, any kind of spring. Once it's gotten hot, a whole bunch of times, and the brakes get really, really hot, um, they kind of lose their springiness, for lack of a better term, or elasticity, I guess. So it helps put brand new springs on. Also, if you lose one, you got backups. <laughs> um, so now. Huge problem that a lot of uh, mechanics run into, especially being in the field. You're in the field, you need to bleed the brake system. You don't have a helper. Nobody to, to mash the old stop pedal. What I use is the tool that I left at my house in Stephenville, it's like 60 miles away. So I went and bought another one. Um, I'm gonna put a link to this one. It's a little Mighty Vac MV8000. 
Um, this is a brake bleeding, uh, it's a little vacuum pump tool. You can use it for a whole bunch of different things. Mainly I use it to, to bleed brakes while it's on the vehicle. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and break this out of the kit. Like I said, if you guys wanna buy this kit, I forget how much it is. I didn't even pay attention when I bought it. I just need it, so I bought it, but I'll put a price here. And uh, if you buy it off that Amazon link, I'm an Amazon affiliate, so if you buy it, I get a small percentage of that sale, which helps out the channel. Uh, I'm gonna break this thing out, get it set up, and then get over to the truck and show you how I bleed brakes. First thing, whenever you're gonna bleed the brakes, if you're going to vacuum bleed them, need to take your lid off. Leave the lid off. Don't put the lead, the lid back on. Um, the way I do this, and everybody's different, um, if you have a turkey baster, you can suck out the contents of the uh, master cylinder. Makes it a little easier for you. Since I don't have a turkey baster deal with me, and I don't feel like uh, siphoning it out, I'm gonna leave it where it's at on the flood level, right there at the minimum. I've already got my bottle open. I'll go back there, I'll, I'll suck out a couple of uh, uh, jars full and I'll come check this. Now, a little disclaimer here, make sure you're using the correct type of brake fluid. Most vehicles out there are dot three. I think Volkswagen, BMWs and German cars are all silicone based, which is dot five. They do not mix, they're different types of fluid. They're not the same style, like one's a, um, uh, mineral oil based and the other one's like an alcohol based or something like that or somebody will correct me in the comments but um i've got my little setup all ready to go right there and let me get my tripod set up and then i'll show you how i do it all right first thing is these little rubber caps on here make sure you don't lose those caps first things first i always loosen these bleeders this is a brand new wheel cylinder so it's not gonna be that big of an issue, but on an older setup, you're probably not gonna be able to use a wrench. You're gonna to have to use a socket, and especially Northern guys, you have to deal with rust. Um, good luck. <laughs> Go ahead and loosen that up. Just tighten it down with your fingers in the meantime. So your vacuum pump. This is how you set it up. You got your little container here, a little rubber deal at the end. You stick that end right over that nipple like that. You have to keep this cup up you know, facing straight up. And then all you do is you pump until you see fluid coming out. And it sounds silly, but yes, I have pumped and pumped and pumped before and realized I didn't loosen the bleeder. Another word of advice, you're loosening the bleeder. You are not um, removing the bleeder. So don't pull it all the way out. I know a lot of you guys have trouble pulling out. That's why you end up with five kids. And once you've uh, pumped and pumped and pumped, you end up with that much fluid. So I'm not gonna do all this on camera, but you see how dark and dirty that fluid is? So brake fluid is clear. Um, what this is, is some rubber inside the hose, the, the rubber hoses, as you can see back in there. Some of that rubber breaks down, gets in there. Um, and this fluid, brake fluid is one of the only fluids in the vehicle that doesn't get cycled, okay? So your brake fluid starts up there, and once it gets down to here, you press your brakes, the fluid just kind of moves into this wheel cylinder and then moves out a little bit. And it kind of stays right in that general area. So it's subjected to a lot of heat, a lot of moisture, or the, the moisture that gets in the system from opening the front will kind of, it's hydroscopic, it'll absorb moisture. You have a wheel cylinder that's leaking like that, it can wick moisture inside of it and everything. But mainly this gets so hot, it kind of burns like that. So it's good, you know, about every 50,000 miles, to go ahead and flush all of your brake fluid out so you you know this is a pretty valuable tool for all you guys if you've never flushed your own brake fluid um, this is the way to do it this is the way i like to do it now there's several other different setups out there there's some that pressurize the master cylinder itself and those work great um, they've got some bleeder screws where you just screw one into the bleeder and then when you hit the brake it ejects air and as soon as fluid comes out it closes the check valve and those work okay this is my preferred method because I can actually see when new fluid gets in here. Um, so what I'll do is I'll dump that fluid out and I'll check my master cylinder. And so my master cylinder's about that far down. So it's gonna take me a little while, but you know, it's a, um, <clears throat> if you're doing the brakes, you wanna do it once and do it right and don't screw around with brake jobs because this is safety stuff, you know? Uh, I always look at every job that I touch on brakes do it, I do it 100%. You're gonna replace everything that I say to replace, or I suggest to replace, with the brand that I like to use and brands I like to use. And if not, I'm not gonna do it because I'm not just worried about you 
on the road driving your own vehicle. I'm worried about the other vehicle that you might crash into. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and finish this up and then we'll start doing that tail shaft still. So that's it for the video. I didn't originally shoot this video with the intention of making a multi-part video series or anything, but I'm editing this video and it's already at 24 minutes. So that's about the maximum length I can get away with uh, uploading a YouTube video. But I hope you guys enjoyed the video. I hope you learned something. I hope it helps you guys out a little bit. Hit that like button, hit the subscribe button, and I will upload the other two parts of this video next couple of days. I appreciate it, and get out and fix something.